The stories that I've put together here, now again there's 23 stories all together in, in, the, in the book East of the Chesapeake. Um, I've written them for various publications over time, uh, but the common theme is that it's people, places, and things on the eastern shore. Uh, and it's, you know, you take a journalistic eye and you look at things and why is it that way? Why is that named that way? What is that statue for? And you start to follow things and on the eastern shore it'll take you back 300 years before you know it. Uh, the first part of the book focuses on the rebuilding of the Skipjack Rosie Parks which was conducted by the Maritime Museum in St. Michael's from with over three years, they, they had this boat that had been part of the museum's collection since 1975, but it had just turned to mush. And there was a fairly large group of uh, folks on the board who thought they just should throw it in the dumpster. Because it was, it was so far gone. When they hauled the Rosie Parks out in, 19, in 2006, 2007, the bottom fell up. The only thing holding the bottom on the boat was the water pressure underneath it. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> and as a result, they, uh, in, they, they started a, a rebuild project and it was interesting because it was right at the sort of the, the height of the recession. But uh, they were able to, f they had a, a, about a $200,000 unencumbered gift and they used that as the base, and part of it was to hire me as a writer to track not only the building of the Rosie Parks, but also the people involved and tell the people stories behind it. They were trying to build Rosie as accurate as, as if it came right off from uh, Bronze's line. Uh, they could have built it Coast Guard approved, but that would have meant bulkheading and all kinds of other things that would have not made it an original. Uh, so they, they, uh, they wanted to have it as close to original as possible. And that meant law, rough sun, lumber. Um, they used a, a local sawmill to cut the ribs out of white oak. Uh, they, had, they wanted the eastern shore yellow pine for the, for the planking. So I started tracking things back to find out where the original wood came from in 1955. Uh, and it was, it was really kind of fun because someone remembered, uh, actually it was Bronze's daughter who's now in her 80s, remembered that her father bought some wood at times from the Spicer Mill uh, in Golden Hill. Uh, did some quick searches, found there was, the Spicer Mill was out of business found an old telephone number associated with it, called the number, it's now a private residential number. Fellow says, oh no, they've been out of business for 20 years. But the postmistress over at uh, Hooper's Island used to be is a spicer, you might call her. So I called the Hooper's Island post office and the woman answered and she says, oh no, you wanna to talk to my uncle, he ran the sawmill. And within minutes, I was talking to him, and not only did he, was he, it was his first major job in the sawmill. He remembers cutting the planks for all three skipjacks out of the woods in, uh, in Dorchester County and taking a, the wood up to Cambridge to get it planed uh, because their planing mill wasn't working, and that's why he remembered, because they had to load it and offload it so many times, and that's where they, found the original wood. So oh. it was stories like that that yeah. uh, just if were intriguing. I had a lot of fun with all of them because there's always something new that you uncover. But a couple of the, the real intriguing ones. One was I, I did a story about the, the history of the C and D canal. And, and you start to find out that the people who were involved in the the building or the decision for the C and D canal and why it is where it is now, uh, where it was a very long involved history that went up through the president's office um, for for thousands for hundreds of years. People from Baltimore wanted to get to the Atlantic the fastest way they could, 
and they had to go down around the capes to get out of the bay. There was a, a small hand dug canal where the current C&D canal is. And after the Civil War, America decided that they needed some kind of way of getting from the Chesapeake and getting out. Uh, and so that at one point there were eight different studies that had different canals cut through the Delmarva. The most intriguing, the one that almost made the books, uh, took ships from Baltimore across the bay into the Chester River, down through an expanded Kent Narrows, down Eastern Bay onto the Miles River, past St. Michael's, then through a cut between the Miles River into the Tread Avon River near Oxford, down there through the Chop Tank River about five miles up from Cambridge, and then a straight cut through to Lewis, Delaware. And they found that that path had fewer frozen days on the bay than any other proposed plant. And all the people in Baltimore wanted it. And it was almost approved. But this was in the late 1890s. And if you'll recall, we got into a major war, not long one, but major war with Spain. And it was primarily a naval war. And they looked at Lewis, Delaware, and the mouth of the Delaware Bay, and they figured, how are we going to fortify that? They looked at the existing canal, which is now where the current canal is, and that is 60 miles up the Delaware River, surrounded on both sides, either by Delaware or New Jersey, easily defensible, and that was the decision. And among the planners was Admiral Dewey. Oh. The, the other one that I really found fascinating was a story that I end the book with. And it's the story of two Johns in uh, Caroline County. Two Johns is a, it's a community now. There's a state uh, or county operated landing uh, where you can put your small boat in. And I saw the name, it sounded intriguing. I, I read uh, 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 Footner's book, uh, Rivers of the Eastern Shore. He has a passing mention of these vaudevillians who had a show called Two Johns and had bought land there back in the 1880s. So I started digging around, went to the Caroline County uh, library. They had a file on, on Two Johns Wharf. There'd been a store there. and. Then about the same time I came across uh, newspapers.com, which is a website that has a couple hundred years worth of digital newspapers from all across the country. Um, I plugged in two Johns and suddenly it lit up. Uh, the play, Two Johns, was, a, was run by a, a fellow named John uh, Crossy. He was an Irish immigrant. Uh, a a, a vaudevillian, man weighed over 400 pounds. And he had put together a play loosely based on Shakespeare's um, Comedy of Errors, in which twins are mismatched and bump in and people think that's one guy and it's actually another. And so he put together, the, he found another fat man and they became the two Johns. And it was a hour and a half sight gag of two fat men walking in having fat jokes in 1870s and 80s. And at five cents and 10 cents a ticket, he made enough money to buy 400 acres as a summer retreat. And so when he moved, he bought the land. Um, it was a, a uh, a fairly large house there, but he converted that into a 21-room mansion complete with garrets. They built a small theater, invited his friends from uh, Tin Pan Alley and Vaudeville and all over. In the summer, they would either come by train from Philadelphia or they would go to Baltimore and show up by ferry uh, to the Denton Wharf. And then he had his own little 40-foot launch. He'd run them back and forth. And so there was a brief mention, as I said, about uh, this in the, in the Footner book. 
Um, he had misspelled it. He said there actually were two Johns. We're actually there was just one John, but he named it after his, his play. Uh, the um, Denton uh, Journal, which is no longer in publication, uh, in, ni in the 1940s, they had a big story about how the two Johns' house finally burned down. It had been vacant. There was tenants in part of it, but a big fire, and it burned to the ground. And they had a big story that was so wrong, it was ridiculous. They had reported that the two Johns were two fellows who lived in this mansion, and one of them died in the garret, and the other disappeared, as would be the, the bo Bohemians of the day. Yeah. And yeah, the, the guy died in bed at age of 75 with a bad heart. The story I wrote in here about uh, uh, Captain Owen Burns. Captain Owen, I was up on a totally different story uh, on Warsaw Manor, which is another interesting story I wrote about, which is this historic 1680s mansion that's been completely restored up in, uh, in Cecil County, off in 301. And I've always wanted to see Bohemia Church, which is a historic churchyard, one of the, the sort of the first outposts of uh, Catholicism on the Eastern Shore. And I, I went over to the churchyard after I did the uh, interviews with Warsaw Manor, and, and I'm walking around this, this beautiful churchyard in, in Bohemia Church, and there's this obelisk in the middle of the, the, the uh, graveyard, and it's dedicated to Captain Owen Burns. It's got a cannon on it, and it's and it's from his, uh, I think there was seven or eight children that had their names all inscribed on it. And, and it piqued my interest. So I went and started tried to find out who in, in this area would rate this Navy captain who was, had died in, after the Civil War. Uh, and who was he and why was this obelisk there? And that sort of, and it was another Fun story. Turns out his his father was a privateer who uh, ran the blockades in the War of 1812. The founder of his family on the on the uh, in actually North Carolina was a Scottish immigrant who came over in the early 1700s and established a fortune. And then Burns um, himself a sea captain uh, found himself as a Confederate loyalist in the Navy and refused to fight for, fight for the, uh, for the uh, U.S. Navy. Uh, wound up being incarcerated, uh, sent off to a prisoner, basically a prisoner of war camp. And his wife, who had a house full of small children and was living up on the Sassafras River at the time, uh, took a boat over to Annapolis. Supposedly, the story goes, she walked to Washington, D.C. and had an audience with Abe Lincoln and said, I need my husband home to help me with the kids. And he will promise not to fight the Union if you send him home. He came home. His kids went on to found Sarasota, Florida. They formed a bank in, in, in uh, Chicago. Uh, another one wound up marrying royalty in, uh, in, into the royal Hawaiian family. Yeah, it's just this, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. You can't.